Hello, chemistry team. Ready for a video number two in our chemical reactions, chemical equations journey. So we looked at chemical reactions in the first video and signs of those in lab. Very commonly what we're going to do for a lot of experiments is run it in laboratory. What do we observe? What do we conclude? Oh, we conclude there's a chemical reaction. Well, how do we represent that? on paper i'll go i guess that's kind of old school how do i represent it on my ipad you know <laughs> however you write it down we need to write down what is happening what is this atomic rearrangement going on and how do we represent that on a two-dimensional surface okay but with computer modeling now these days, I mean, we could we could make that three dimensional and colorful. And there's a lot of cool stuff. But let's just say we got a piece of paper in lab and we're filling it in. In general, obviously, we're starting with some species. We're mixing them together. We're reacting them together. And if a reaction does occur, it forms or we produce something. Correct. So let's just say what we start with, whether it's one species, two or three, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what phase they are. It could be a solution, could be a solid. So we did several different types of situa situations in the last video. Whatever we mix together. We're going to use that arrow to separate those to show the progress of change, right? So we're going for starting with these and ending up with these. And we're producing these products. Whatever those are, it could be one product, it could be two, three, four different species. Whatever their states are or phases, doesn't really matter. At this point, it's just a generic process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to race this board and go through what kind of information we can glean or, or put, if we're writing one, what information do we need to put into this chemical equation that represents a chemical reaction or chemical change? Or if we're provided a chemical equation, right, what information can we extract from it? So there's some pretty important things, and I find a lot of students get pretty sloppy on this, and they just they leave information out with the assumption that, it, well, it's obvious what that the state should be. It's obvious that should be aqueous, or it's obvious that. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't ever assume it's obvious to whoever's reading your paper, <laughs> all right? So, oh, hey, I'm a hard nose on this. I want you to include it all every time to get into the habit of doing things right. All right, I'm going to race this board and put up the information we need to put into or we can extract from a written chemical equation. When you are in lab or on an exam or something like that or homework and you're trying to represent a chemical reaction on paper via a chemical equation, here's what you need to include. Or if I give you one, here's information you can get from it. First and foremost, absolutely critical, and you pretty much have to go in this order. What are your reactant identities and what are your product identities written as chemical formulas? So if you've got sodium chloride, if you've got glucose, if you've got lead to nitrate or ammonia or carbon dioxide, doesn't matter. Oxygen, is it diatomic or monatomic? You got to write those down. Now, sometimes those are both provided for you, reactant and product. Sometimes in lab, neither are provided. And you just, you know, you're looking on a bottle and you only have a name. You're like, oh, crud. Now i got to figure out what the formula of that reactant is. Sometimes you have, you're given the reactant formulas. you got to predict the product formulas. That's going to be a little more heavy next chapter. I just want you to get to the basics of chemical equations down. So that's the first thing you need to do. you got to go. It's like cooking. If I want to make some brownies, I need flour, I need sugar, I need, you know, this and this and this. And if I mix them together in the correct ratios, boom, I will get my brownies. Hey, so chemistry is a lot like cooking. Lots and lots. You just follow the recipe, right? Another thing that I'm pretty strict on is the state. Some people will say phase as well. So if it's a solid, give me that in parentheses with an S. Or if it's a liquid or a gas. Or if it's uh, dissolved in water, you've got a solution. AQ, an aqueous-based solution. We're going to do a sol more solution chemistry in the next chapter. That's a little more complicated. A lot of people leave those off. I want you to put those in every time. If you give me a, a reactant or product identity, tell me what its state is. And I want you to get in the habit of that because when we get to thermodynamics or thermochemistry later on down the road, 
we're going to calculate the energy changes that can occur. And the numbers we plug in are dependent on what its state is. The value for a liquid, like for water, is different for a solid, is different for a gas. So if you don't write the state down and you don't know what phase it is or state, you're like, ah, I don't know what number to use off these tables. That's going to be critical. So what I'm doing is I'm preparing you uh, so that you don't get into a bad habit that's going to bite you in the butt later on down the road. So please, please, please include those. Even if it feels redundant. Oh, but it takes so long. It takes you like, you know, 0.2 milliseconds. Bloop, and it right does it well. Maybe not that quick. But you write them down fast. It's not going to kill your time. Any special reaction conditions I'd like you to include in there. That's going to be more organic chemistry um, where you might have, you know, maybe this reaction only occurs at a specific pH, right? It's a, in a you know, pH less than 7 in a acidified environment or pH greater than 7 in a, some basic environment. Maybe a specific temperature or temperature range. Uh, maybe a catalyst. You've all heard of catalytic converters. So maybe this reaction doesn't occur unless you put a little platinum in there, something weird. We'll learn about catalysts later. But commonly you see those written above the arrow. So you got the reactants products with an arrow between them. You'll see those written above or below the arrow. A lot of times if you have to heat it up at a higher temperature, so you see a triangle above the arrow representing heat was placed into that. Um, again, you'll, you'll see those every once in a while in lab. Not too critical at this point, but that you'll see that a lot in organic chemistry. Uh, and last but not least, we need to balance this equation. We're going to spend some time learning how to do that because we have to obey the law of conservation of mass, right? You can't have an atom of lead just disappear. Or else, like, where did it go? You can't have an atom of tungsten just appear out of nowhere. It's like magic. There is no magic here, even though it might look like magic sometimes. It's not magic. <laughs> right? It's the closest I came to being able to do magic. So we need to balance the atoms for each element. So always balance the equation. And always, 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 always do this last. You have to have the reactant and product identities, which is the atomic ratio of the elements in that species. That's what sets its identity. Then you balance it. Don't try to balance something before you have the reactant and product chemical formulas. It's, gonna, it's just going to destroy this whole process. So make sure you do it in this order. And, what's gonna, and that's going to lead us to a huge topic in chemistry called stoichiometry. Kind of a crazy word. But that numeric ratio between reactant, you know, two reactants or between a reactant and a product, once we've balanced a chemical equation and obeyed the law of conservation of mass, we're going to have these mathematical ratios, right? Kind of like you're cooking. Two cups of sugar plus three cups of flour plus two teaspoons of horseradish sauce plus a, a gallon of molasses. I'm not a good cook. You can probably figure it out from that point. <laughs> right? Well, I guess I could cook if I want to. I just don't have the patience. I'm hungry. Oh, I want to eat now. I don't want to spend an hour cooking something. But I guess if I really had to sit down and do it, it'd be like running a chemical reaction. I could probably do it just fine. I just don't have the patience for it. A lot of chemistry is like boom, boom. It's automatic. Right? It's almost instant. You're like, yay, I like those things. So we balance it to obey the law of conservation of mass. Make sure you got the same number of atoms of each element on each side of the arrow, right? They can't just, if we got five atoms of sodium, we better have five atoms of sodium on both sides of the arrow before and after the reaction. Again, they can't disappear or pop out of nowhere. And that gives us the mathematical ratio between them. And that's going to lead us into the very, very common realm of stoichiometry, doing mathematics from balanced chemical equations. So let's look at how to balance equations real quick. Kind of intuitive. There's not no real rules per se. It's intuitively obvious in most situations, but there's some weird ones that can hit you. And we'll introduce some different types of reactions. Maybe you saw in introductory chemistry. We'll kind of review that as we're doing these. Let me erase the board. We'll be right back up. Hopefully these will help you. Again, there's no real step-by-step -step rules to do this. Um, and commonly, you'll balance the majority of them just by inspection, just kind of looking at it. Um, but every once in a while, you're like, well, I gotta, you know, I'm gotta you know, scratch my head a little bit on this one. So again, first and foremost, when you're balancing a chemical equation to obey the law of conservation of mass, the number of atoms of each element has to, no exception, my friends, this is the law of the land in chemistry, you have to have exactly the same number of atoms of each element on both sides of the arrow, on the reactant side and product side. Otherwise, you're disobeying the law of conservation of mass. It can't happen. All right? Again, atoms can't just disappear and pop out of existence or pop in from nowhere. My recommendation, it's not a rule, start with elements found in only one species on each side of the arrow. 
You look at the reactant side, maybe you get two or three species. Look at the product side, maybe you get two or three species. And I will always hone in on an element that's in only one species on the reactant side, on the left side of the arrow, and in only one species on the product side, on the right side of the arrow. Makes it pretty easy to balance, right? Usually that's gonna be a metal. You can make a note and say, you know, commonly that's gonna be a metal like manganese, zinc, or copper. I got the copper in one species on the reactant side and the copper's on one species on the product side. I can balance those quite readily. And once I'm done with that, then I'll look for another element that does that. I won't try to commonly balance oxygen and hydrogen first because commonly those are found. See, if I see oxygen in two of my reactants and one of my products or two of my products, good luck. That's like one equation and two unknowns. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to do. So commonly the last element, you'll do all the easy ones first. And the last element that's in multiple species on each side just kind of works out at the very end once you get all the other ones done. Right? So maybe you have three different types of elements in the equation. Take the two that are the most intuitively obvious first, and then the last one it just falls into place. Like you're making a puzzle. It's hard at first, and then as you're getting closer to being finished, it accelerates. It just kind of happens. Bad analogy, but I just did a puzzle. <laughs> um, and then this is another rule of the uh, land. Never, I'm talking never, ever, ever, ever alter the subscripts. Right, so once I've made you know uh, the chemical form, let's say carbon dioxide, CO sub two, right? C sub one, O sub two. You don't write the one that we learned in the last chapter. You cannot change that. It's like when you have a recipe, right? You got flour, you got sugar, you got all this, and if you mix those in the right proportions, you will get this. Right, but if you change the flour out and make it mayonnaise, I don't know what you're gonna get. Right, <laughs> you ain't gonna get a brownie. So you have to have to keep the identities of your reactants and products intact. You cannot change CO2 to CO4. That, that's not carbon dioxide anymore. That's uh, you know murder in first degree in chemistry. You can only alter the coefficient. And we're going to stick with just integers at this point. So one, two, three, four, five, no halves. Or any. We're going to stay away from fractions, except for very specific things we'll see in thermo thermodynamics later. So you can change the coefficient, which is the integer out in front of the species. So I could have one carbon dioxide molecule or two carbon dioxide molecules. So I could change that to five or 15 or 522. It doesn't matter what that number is. You can change that as much as you want until the atoms of each element are balanced on both sides. But don't ever change the subscripts, please. Don't ever change the subscripts, my friends. Once the identity's there, don't change the identity. Let's do some practice. Let's start with something real simple, just to, you know, we're getting on the skateboard, then we'll get to the tricycle, then we'll get to the bicycle, then the motorcycle, then the Lamborghini, and then the jet airplane. <laughs> So let's say I give you the the all the reactants and products identities. Now, commonly later on down the road, I would expect you to know these. I would expect you to know hydrogen is a diatomic gas, oxygen is a diatomic gas, water is H2O, those kinds of things, right? But let's say, and this is the demo I did where I just created a huge fireball and went inside the fireball, right? It was a way bigger fireball than I planned. So hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and I had to give it a little spark, right? So this is that situation where we have a special condition. That means heat added. So if you ever see that little triangle, that means we did it at a higher temperature than room temperature or heat was added to it. So for me, I took a cigarette lighter, and that was really stupid. I probably should have, you know, had it far away from me on a string with a candle on the end of a big meter stick or something. But no, I was a dummy holding it. Boom. <laughs> it blew up in my face. Whew. Got to be careful in chemistry, man. Think before you do things. Or do what I say, not what I do, right? <laughs> When we mix those, we get water. We'll look at the energetics of that later, but it's highly exothermic, all right? Even off a lot, but it needs a little spark to it. Now, obviously, this is not balanced. Let's take a look. Now, if you can just do this in your head, just do it in your head. But we should be able to track this pretty readily. Sometimes I'll do this. If you're stuck, you can do this, but you don't ever have to show me this, okay? Let's write down the elements that we have. So we got some hydrogen and we've got some oxygen on both sides, right? So there's my hydrogen, there's my oxygen. Now, if we had chlorine here, I'd be like, where did the chlorine come from? It'd be weird. So at least we got the same elements on both sides. Now let's count them up. What you do is you take the coefficient, 
Now, if there's no coefficient here, it's a 1. It's got to be a 1. Take the coefficient times the subscript. So 1 times 2 is 2. So we have two atoms of hydrogen on the reactant side. 1 times 2 is two atoms of hydrogen. That's what we're starting with, right? So coefficient of 1. Again, if there's nothing there, it's assumed to be a 1. So you don't write a 1 there. It's an assumption. Over here, we've got nothing in front of the water, so we're assuming that's a coefficient of 1. 1 times 2 would be two hydrogens. Hey, hydrogen's already balanced. Sweet! One times, and if there's no subscript there, that's a one, correct? So one times one is one. So this is an unbalanced equation. You can see it, right? You got the two there and you got the one there. You can see it's unbalanced, but if you're having trouble, you can just write those numbers down. So now we've got to fix this, right? Pretty easy. We don't have to follow those rules before. We only have one product, so we got everything in there. Hydrogen's balanced. So in order to do this, this should be pretty straightforward. Right? Now, if you don't follow my rules, this is not what you do. I just go, you could just go, hmm, couldn't I just put a two there? And one times two is two. Everything's balanced. Yay, me! Happiness is no, 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 no. You now go to prison for first degree murder. You change the subscript. You can't do that because that's no longer water anymore. That's hydrogen peroxide. Do you want to drink a gallon of water or a gallon of hydrogen peroxide? Hydrogen peroxide is very different properties, my friends. You'd find that out real quick when you start. Don't do that, <laughs> right? You cannot do it. It's like saying, you know, mixing all the ingredients to make brownies forms a brownie, and then you do the exact same thing, mixing all the ingredients for a brownie forms mustard. You can't change it. So that's a big, big no-no right there. Even though it did balance it, you altered the identity. Big, big no-no. Everybody, is that clear? Did I make that clear enough? Don't ever change the subscript. So I have to change the coefficient. I have to put a two out in front of the water. So now two times one, is two and my oxygens are balanced. Ah, oh, crud! But now my hydrogens are. Two times two is four. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better, my friends. Kind of like cleaning your room or garage out. Sometimes it gets way worse until you can reorganize it and make it better. <laughs> so now that my hydrogen's messed up, I can go back here and go, oh, look, the hydrogen and oxygen are separate. So I need two times two is four. So if I put a two here, now I have four hydrogen atoms on each side and two oxygen atoms on the inside, and I'm properly balanced this time. I have not changed the subscripts or the identities of anything. This is how we do it. Let's do something a little more challenging this time. Here's the type of problem you'll see on an upcoming quiz or exam. Hey, hey. And I can make this a little bit harder, but let's say we take some solid magnesium. React it with some diatomic nitrogen gas. Know your diatomic elements, my friends. Very important. And we get some magnesium nitride. I don't necessarily have to give you the formula for magnesium nitride. If we take a synth, and this is synthesis, some people call it addition or combination, where you take uh, two elements, combine them together, add them together, so you can see where the addition or combination reaction term comes from. We learn these in introductory chemistry. So this should not be new for you. Uh, but what, technically what we're doing is we're taking two elements and synthesizing a compound. So addition reaction, synthesis reaction, addition, uh, combination reaction. You're taking two elements and forming a compound. So two or more reactants, only one product. And since this is a metal and a non-metal, all you got to do is just find the, the preferred charges. You know magnesium prefers a plus two if you don't look that up. You know, the nitride ion is always a minus three. If you don't, look that up. So if nitride's a minus three and magnesium's a plus two, they're not the same. They, they don't cancel out in a one-to-one -one ratio. So you need three magnesiums at a plus two charge to give you a plus six, and two nitride ions at a minus three. Two times minus three is negative six. Negative six, positive six cancel out, give you a neutral species. Little review there for you. Ha, ha, ha. So I would expect you to be able to predict the product from a synthesis reaction like this. But anyway, obviously not balanced. Now, if you can see it in your head, great. If not, go ahead and write out the table like this, where you've got the magnesium, you've got the nitrogen, you've got the magnesium, you've got the nitrogen. If you have to do that, do that. It's okay. I don't care. But I think most of you could probably do it in your head. Starting out with, I have a coefficient of 1 times a subscript of 1, so 1 magnesium. Coefficient of 1 times a subscript of 2, 2 nitrogens to start with. 
Over here, I got a coefficient of one times the subscript of three. So I have three magnesium. There are ions on that side, but it doesn't matter if they're ion or atom in this scenario. And we got one times two or two nitrogens. Now my nitrogens are balanced, yay, but my magnesiums are not. So it should be pretty obvious if I got three magnesiums here, I'll, you know, I can't do a sub three, right? Magnesium's a monatomic element. So if I put a three here, three times one is three. Now three equals three. Two equals two. Oh! <gasps> Are you going to drop the class? Was that too hard for you? <laughs> Sometimes they work out that easy. Sometimes they're already balanced. We'll find later when we do a lot of acid-base reactions. It, they're, before you even begin, right? That you write the identities of reactants and products. It's already balanced. You're like, hallelujah, breakdown. That was awesome. Right? I thought that would be harder when it was, but it's not. So let's do one more and call it a day. All right, you remember this from last semester, the opposite of the synthesis reaction? Decomposition, all right. So here you've got the one reactant and it breaks apart to form two or more products. So that's your decomposition. In this case, we're adding heat, so that'd be a thermal decomposition. Give this one a shot, all right? Pause the video, see if you can balance this one. And if you need to do all the, the things, that's great. If you need to draw the, the chart, but we could probably just figure this out looking at it. The aluminum's are already balanced, right? You see one aluminum here, one times one, one times one. But I got one times two or two fluorines on the right-hand side, and I got one times three, three fluorines. So I got three here, which is an odd number, and two here, which is an even number. So you gotta find the common multiple between two and three, which happens to be six, right? So in order to get six fluorines, I need to take two times three. So I need to multiply this whole thing by two, so two times three would give me six fluorines. You see that? So here that's a two. So if I put a three here, that would give me six fluorines. See how I worked that out? So if you got an odd number on one side and an even on the number, you can find the common multiple between them. Now let's take a look at the aluminums. That gives me two times one, which is two aluminums, correct? And I only have one aluminum there. So if I put a two here, that would give me two aluminums on that side and two aluminums on that side. Check, and again, you can just do that in your head. I don't care. So two aluminums, two aluminums. Two times three is six fluorines. Three times two is six fluorines. Wada bing, wada boom. Oh, let's do one more. <laughs> let's do a combustion reaction. Give this one a shot on your own. This will be a little trickier. I'm gonna show you a little trick at the end because we wanna avoid fractions for coefficients if we can. So remember combustion, we did combustion analysis where if you take any hydrocarbon, something that contains hydrogen and carbon, and burn it, let's boil it. Add some oxygen gas. When you're combusting, you're adding O2 gas. Give it a little sparky. This is how you heat your homes. This happens to be butane with four carbons. You'll learn this in organic chemistry. Methane would have one carbon. Uh, if you had a barbecue, maybe use some propane gas. That would be three carbons. Um, way to figure that out. But you'll always, all the carbon, we're gonna assume all the carbon becomes CO2 and all the hydrogen becomes uh, a part of water. I'm gonna go let a cat out, hold on. Don't want that cat howling in the background there. Let me out, let me out. All right, so here we'll get CO2 and water. This is gonna require that one rule, not rule, but kind of a helping point where notice you've got oxygen in one species on the reactant side, but in two separate species on the product side. Don't try to balance the oxygen until last. Save that for last. It would be too challenging because how would you know how to split the coefficients up? So let's start, take a look at carbons in one species on the left-hand side and one species on the right. That should be pretty easy. Hydrogen's on one species on the left and one species on the right. So carbon and hydrogen, doesn't matter what order, but you could do those two first. And then we'll figure out the oxygen, which will, be, which will require a little bit of a trick. So I got four carbons here and one there. So it's a pretty obvious to you that we need to put a four in front of the CO2. Now our carbon's balanced. We have 10 hydrogens, one times 10 is 10. Well, we've got two here, so two times five would be 10. So if I pop a five there, my hydrogens are balanced. Everybody good with that one? So let's go through. Now let's look at the total number of oxygens. Would you agree on this side, I have two oxygens, okay? So on this side, I have two oxygen atoms. 
on this side, four times two is eight, right? Five times one is five. What's eight plus five? This is where I screwed up. I have thir not 130 atoms, 13 oxygen atoms, not 130 atoms. <laughs> and that's not 20, I have two oxygen atoms. The oxygen looks like a zero sometimes. So two does not equal 13, that's odd, that's even. All right, so you can do this in one of two ways. You could do the common multiple between two and 13, or if you look at it, what would we have to put here? That's the only, we need 13 oxygen atoms on this side. So two times what gives you 13? That would be 13 halves. Do you see that? But we don't want, now that would be balanced, correct? I'd have four carbons, 10 hydrogens, 13 halves times two is 13 equals 13. This is technically balanced, but we want to avoid fractions if we can, okay? Avoid fractions for your coefficients. Not technically wrong. So what we're going to do is you see the, uh, this is a little trick. You see the, the denominator and in the, in the fraction, the 2. If we multiply everything by 2, that will give you 2 butanes, 2s cancel out, 13 oxygens, 8 CO2s, and 10 waters. Do you see that trick there? Now you could avoid it all that just looking at the common multiple between these, but let's go ahead and do this. Let's multiply everything through by two. You don't run into this often, but I just want to show you the trick. So now if I put a two, two times one is two, two times 13 halves is 13, two times four is eight, two times five is 10. So now I have 13 times two, is 26 oxygen atoms. 8 times 2 is 16. 10 times 1 is 10. 16 plus 10 is 26 oxygens on each side. 8 carbons, 20 hydrogens. Do you see that nice little trick there? You can balance things. You guys got it.